so uh, like I was uh, telling you early, uh, Chan Film is uh, a small uh, production company who are based in Los Angeles, California, or so we have offices in Cape Verde, West Africa. And the reason why we created this course, in Chan Film School, uh, to discuss digital cinematography, it's uh, very uh, unusual because sometimes you have traditional way to teach, but we teach online, we teach via Zoom. And also we have the uh, taught copper courses in the different countries in person. But after pandemic in 2020, uh, more precisely every 25th, the 2020, we started this uh, course via Zoom. And uh, we had uh, students from different parts of the world. But right now, as the pandemics, you know, slow down a little bit, we start with the festival in Cape Verde, uh, International Film Festival. So this uh, course is also part of this Jarfog International Film Festival. They go together. So the reason why we create this digital cinematography is to support, but also to share knowledge with uh, filmmakers and learn from them, you know, trying to see what a filmmaker, independent filmmakers uh, in the, this world of independent filmmaking uh, is looking for, what are they interested to discuss, what the issue they have, so we're here to support much we can. And in the meantime, we wanted to develop network uh, with the filmmakers. So saying that this digital uh, cinematography, it uh, combines uh, traditional filmmaking artists concepts with the technology tools using independent news gathering and documentary filmmaking. Uh, also, we work with a commercial production and uh, uh, web content. Um, the course is structured in different uh, topics, different parts, uh, includes uh, screenwriting, cinematography itself, directing, film analysis, uh, art design, location, etc. etc. Also, we deal with uh, editing. We you know, we teach about editing, how to then we go to a different part. Uh, when your film is ready, what do you do with your film? And then you submit it to the film festival, then you get distribution kind of stuff. So all those aspects are part of this uh, course. And we call it digital cinematography because today everything is digital. And uh, uh, we teach about lighting, we teach about film history, uh, film editing, uh, how to use a uh, camera, how to light a scene, for example, in terms of cinematography. As a cinematographer, uh, uh, sometimes most, the majority of your work is to, you know, uh, discourse and share knowledge with, uh, you director of the film and you have to know how to light a scene how to you know make composition all those things so this course is uh, more practical in terms of what do you have in terms of uh, what do you wanted to work um, what do you what are you working on right now what kind of project you have so then you bring those projects to us we discuss those projects and give you some guidance on the, how to make those projects, uh, you know, uh, take it into the completion kind of stuff. But also, you know, if you have any question, you have any comments, anything, feel free to talk to us. And uh, even if you feel, you know, you're not, uh, you don't want it to talk, you can write questions, then we can answer questions, no problem. 
and uh, we also work with uh, another aspect of this digital cinematography is directing, how you direct a scene, how you work with actors, how you cast your talents. Uh, you know, all those kind of stuff are very important. So we discuss that. In terms of film analysis, we uh, bring the films, you know, class films, and uh, we discuss those films with uh, students. And uh, we present our analysis about each film and uh, the relevance of that film, particular film. In terms of the art design and location, it's very important to know where you're going to shoot your film, how you're going to have the set, all those kinds, all those kind of things. So, do you have any questions and comments? No, sounds good. Okay. Uh, do you have any project that you are working right now? You are working on any project right now? Uh, yes, I have um, a project, uh, but uh, I didn't uh, edit it. So, okay, so if you have a trailer, if you have anything you want to share with us, that's a good way, that's the best way, for example, to, um, to give you some... Um, tips to give you some um, guidance uh, how to approach those issues and how to solve those issues but you know that's up to you if you want to do that we are uh, interested to uh, to uh, to help you or just share some knowledge with you in that direction so you let you let me know uh, if you are interested uh, in that. If you are interested to share any information with us. You have a question? Um, no, uh, my uh, trailer um, of uh, the film Child Free uh, is that um, uh, okay? Okay, no problem. No problem. You you are free. You know whatever you want to do, it's cool with us. Um, so, is there any particular subject? Uh, do you want to discuss today? Mm, I hear your voice badly. Okay, let's. Uh, we have an hour and a half. Usually, this class is one hour, and uh, we can take. Uh, uh, We'll take one hour to talk about some stuff. Then we have like 15, 30 minutes to uh, just to talk, to discuss things that you may be interested to, to present in, in discussion. Today is you, only you and myself. Usually you have a lot of folks. Uh, this is the first sec. Uh, the fourth section. Uh, see, this is the fourth series of this course, and this is the first. Um, this is a spring uh, section. So we have students, but for some reason they did not show up today. But um, if you wanted to go, if you have any question, you wanted to write it down, I can talk about it. Or if you have anything you wanted to um, to present to me, you let me know anytime soon. But usually, what I do, uh, I talk a little bit about cin cinematography. Why cinematography is important? You want to share any knowledge 
why cinematography is important, why the picture, why you show this picture, why you show this particular picture you don't show, uh, why you choose the best picture, the best landscape, why you choose, why you, why you make that decision as a filmmaker. Mm. I don't uh, idea about this. So you don't know why you show the best. Uh, uh, I haven't uh, knowledge uh, any cin cinematography. Oh, you don't have knowledge about cinematography? Yes. OK, so let's share a little bit about cinematography then, uh, so we can discuss a little more about it. Okay, so. This is only, you can find this information online, maybe better than this. Um, cinematography is an art, like he, anything else, uh, you, may be very familiar with uh, painting. Uh, you may be very familiar with uh, photography, with picture. So cinematography as a, as a concept is the art and technology of motion picture photography. Uh, why is it important? It's important because you need to show visual when you tell a story. Uh, you work with the visuals. If you work with the visuals, then why uh, you want to show the best visual? Because people will be more engaged, the, the, the audience will be more engaged in your story, will be more, more interested to learn, uh, to follow your story, to stay with you during the, whatever time you have. So this is the reason why the first five, 10 minutes, 10 seconds of, in films, you show the best picture uh, possible uh, because that's the way you're gonna uh, gain uh, your audience. You're gonna, gonna get them in an emotional way. So that's why cinematography is very important. Without cinematography, you not you will have no film. So you have to have a picture, and the picture must be very good uh, so to create a picture to film a, a, a picture for example to to record a picture or to take a picture you need a camera right so yes. if you need a camera then you have to to learn about the techniques and uh, one of the best techniques uh, in, in terms of cinematography uh, then you have to know this lighting, how to light uh, a scene, uh, how to create a composition of a scene, uh, how can you make those things uh, in terms of location, uh, camera choice, what camera you wanted to use, Canon, uh, Ari Alex, uh, Red, uh, whatever you have, Sony, there's many cameras these days, uh, a thousand of them. So do you have to make your decision? That's your decision as a filmmaker or cinematographer uh, then to make that decision with you as a director of the film. Then you have to choose a lens, what kind of lens you're gonna need. You're gonna need wide lens to show the landscape. You need a 16 millimeter, 14 millimeter, you need 24 millimeter, 18 millimeter, so on. So if you shoot a landscape, then you want it to go like 16 because you want to show large space. So if you want it to show very tiny space, then you go like 85, you go 135, you go 300 kind of stuff. If you want it to have in poetry, you know, median shot, then you go 50, 40, uh, you know those things, right? That's something new to you or? or... Uh, 
Uh -huh. This is something new to you. A lens is new. Is it something new? Um, no, uh, I um, I know it. Um, I I said that uh, misansen. Okay, okay. You you talk different language, but it's still the same. Yes. It's just uh, a way. Yes. To say it. It's okay. Um, so in terms of lens, and then you talk about filters. Why you do you need a filter? So in the bright day on the desert kind of stuff. So I use a filter to you know to to work you know to exposure uh, to give you the best exposure possible that you need. And uh, either you go digital or you go with the film stock. It's still same concept, same thing. Film is a little different than digital but still the same thing. Then you have to deal with the camera angle, right? What a low mm -hmm. angle, right angle. Then you deal with the camera movements. You have the pan, you are pushing, you have zoom. Zoom is different type of movement, but you have dolly in, you have dolly out. So, you know, that's very important to integration. Uh, in terms of integration of any special effects that you wanted to create on the scene. Uh, an example of cinematography for many uh, masters, uh, cinematographers and filmmakers, they say lighting, camera filters and lens uh, are part of how you should, you should uh, a scene, how you combine those things, how do you combine those things? to create uh, a scene. So I think better than a talk, uh, let's, watch, let's watch this video. Okay, before we go, I wanted to, Go to go a little more. We should, I'll show you the video a little late. A little later. I'm sorry. Uh, one of one of the questions that usually we we ask it's why cinematography is important in film. Why cinematography is important. Uh, as I told you before, it supports overall look and mood of a film, a visual narrative. So without cinematography, there's, then we don't have a film. If we understand the cinematography, then we we'll understand why and how to use cinematography. Each visual element that appears on screen, the missing scene, like you call it, of a film can serve and they nice it, and nice it, the story. Well, in other words, it helps you to tell the story. Cinematographer has responsibility to ensure that every element is cohesive and supports the story. So you don't want to just show uh, a visual. You want to show visual that supports your story. It doesn't make any sense to just show things just because you want to show it, just because it's look good. Now, it's look good, but it has to support the story. It has to advance your story. Cinematography does that. So you have to understand, in terms of cinematography, However you think, there's three base, basic elements. I already told you about them before. One of the very important aspects is the exposure. So you have to know about exposure. Then lighting. Lighting is very important. The other element is a camera angle or camera position. 
like I told you before, camera positioning and movement are very, very, very important. Every film, you can see it yourself and uh, you find those elements. You find a good exposure. You, you find a nice lighting. You find a nice camera movement. And uh, for those who doesn't know how to use those three elements, then it's maybe better find other kind of profession because you have to understand those things very, very, very good. You have to be mastering yourself every day on those aspects. Uh, well, we are here to learn, we are here to uh, share knowledge. Do you have questions? Do you have anything you wanted to, to add it to it? Feel free to share any information or any comments. Mm -hmm. uh, please repeat. Hmm? Repeat it again. Do you want me to repeat? Uh, said, repeat your, your question. I said, tell me, uh, ask any question or any comments you may have. Uh, okay, um, I can, um, this uh, knowledge, um, uh, after the class. Okay, no problem. You can send your question next after the class, then we can work on that next, uh, next section, okay? Okay, uh, excuse me. Um, I uh, my uh, phone is uh, finishing a charge, uh -huh. uh, but I um, I don't have a, a sound. Okay, no problem. You wanna to continue or you wanna stop here? We can continue next Saturday. Uh, okay, um, I like to continue. You uh, wanna but, continue? Um, yes, uh, but my uh, headphone is unable okay no problem okay you can we can continue no problem okay let me let me i don't uh, have your uh, voice i still can hear uh, because my my iphone is charging okay okay um, okay then the next the next aspect of the filmmaking uh cinematography what I wanted to share with you right now is the concept of five C's. Do you know what's five C's? So five C's, uh, five C's, uh, it's a very important concept in cinematography. It's, a, it's one of the most important aspects of cinematography to me. Uh, why? Because if you know the five concepts of the concept of five C's, then you understand the very basic of filmmaking. One, one of the aspects of five C's is the camera angles. We already touched that a little bit. There is a continuity. Why continuity? You need a continuity in a scene. Why do you need to know about continuity. You need to know if you face this way, if you face this side, in the next scene, you can face this, scene, this side. You can face this way. Still, you have continuity. You show this face, then you show another face. But what about if you show this face I mean, I mean this this side, or or you look this way, and you repeat the next shot the same way, looking the same direction. Let's put it the other way. 
I'm filming a scene. I have two consecutive median shots. It's a median shot, median shot, median shot. Same direction. I'm looking into the camera all the time. On those three moments, three shots or three takes, the way you want to call it, I don't have any way to mount to edit uh, that three different uh, face. I, I mean three same face. I'm, we deal with three. Uh, we dealing with three. We, we're dealing here with a repetition of the takes. One, you show the face. Two, you show the same face. Three, you show the same face again. So that's not going to work. So that's a problem with uh, continuity. But if I show you, if I've taken one take, I'm facing to the camera, but the other, I'm facing the other side, then when you get into the editing stage, we can edit uh, those takes without jumping, what are called jump cuts. So that's one part of continuity. The other part of continuity, are you going north? You're going north, then you show south. You show, first you show north. But then you cannot show south because this is not continuity. This is why when you flew the drone, you fly drone, for example, to give you a dimension of the space. Then you show the car or have a situation or show the person. But then this is a lot of different aspect of continuity. So you have to understand why we decided to show the landscape, why we show someone on this side of the car, then we move the camera on the other side to show the other side. So we have continuity when we start to edit the film. I'll, I'll give you another example. This phone, for example, if we shoot this phone, facing to me, the phone is facing to me, right? We see okay. the back, right? The camera see the back of this, this phone. So if I do another take, if I take another take in the same space, same with same lens, with the same uh, camera focal distance, everything is the same, it's gonna have jump cut. So we don't wanna do that. So that's why we discuss uh, continuity in the five C's. The, uh, another element of five C's is the cutting, or, or I already told you that about editing. Cutting is me editing something. Then we discuss about close ups. Close ups are very important to show details, to show uh, inside, uh, for example, hands. Uh, you show the face, right? You can show the face, but then you show the hands. You see, if you are doing this in a scene, you show my face, then you show my hands, then you see how those things works, how those things are important in a cinematography. So close up are very important because it shows details. It shows the things that we cannot see. So we can see it in close up. Then the other C is a composition. How are you gonna work with the rule of a third? Uh, so how are you gonna frame each scene? How are you gonna combine 
a lighting, composition, and the camera angle. So all those elements are very, very, very important. Uh, this is a very nice book. I will send it to you later. I will send you notes on that, this book. Uh, that you may be interested to, to learn a little more about it. Any question and comments? Um, no, I um, uh, I can um, before um, this course yeah, yeah, or uh, session right. course. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I have a um, text uh, you uh, teaching it. Okay, you can uh, because I email. you can send me an email with questions. Then next section we can go through your questions. Okay. Uh, yes, I uh, I have it. Uh, I um, uh, read them and um, um, uh, it's better for me. Okay. Okay. No problem. That's cool. So let's let's look to something here. Okay, I'm going to show this with you. I like to show you uh, this video. Things that solve for every project fall under the category of what responsibilities are, but I think it also changes based on the project. Um, so, we'll just so the question, the question here is, uh, what is the job of cinematographer? What he does or she does? Uh, we have a lot of female, you know, uh, amazing and uh, very talented uh, cinematographers. Uh, so the question here is, is what is the job of a cinematographer? So let's see here. What obviously some kind of things that fall for every project fall under the category of what your responsibilities are, but I think it also changes based on the project. Um, so we'll just focus on that, like for all strips. I mean, I think obviously it's you know to capture the the performances and the story in a way that that fits the project and what you've talked about with the director. Um, I think it's about. But it's also about making sure that you complete all of that. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, how good a shot looks or how much it fits if you don't have all the other shots to complement it and tell the story. So it's also about kind of managing time and giving the director as much time with the actors as they can get um, so that they can either, you know, get as many takes as they want or have as much rehearsal time as they want. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's about, it's about being, you know, uh, creative and creating the proper look, but then also, and just hitting the technical things of making sure you have kind of the exposure in the range you need it to be. Um, and then, yeah, just being kind of considerate of the, the other departments. I think that's the main thing that people kind of forget when they're, when they're first starting is that it's, you know, it's not uh, an individual thing where it's like, oh, well, my, my side of the crew hit what they needed to hit. Good, we're, you know, we're done, we're set. It's about making sure that everybody is, you know, hitting the same thing at the same time. Um, yeah, so it's about doing that, it's about delivering, you know, all of that so that the director and the actors and everyone and producers can, can get what they want out of the story and have, you know, as much time, as much uh, end material for editing. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I think, the toughest thing about being on set, uh, or I, I think, like, about the job is making sure that you, that you 
have all that planned out. I think it's a lot of just pre-planning before if you know exactly what you're going in to do and you know exactly how you want to do it, you'll be ready when it all changes because it always does. Um, uh, you know, sometimes more than others, but inevitably things are, are not going to be as you planned. I think as, as long as you have that structure to fall back on, you'll move in kind of a proper direction forward to address those issues in accordance with the look of the film or how you're going to move on. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just really working closely with, with the director, uh, I think especially the first AD and then um, the production designer, so that you, you all know kind of what needs to be ready when and how it's all going to flow so that you get there and, um, you know, and, well, and your crew as well, talking to your gaffer and your grips and your camera team so they know kind of what the plan is and that, um, you know, you're not wasting time figuring it out on the day. Um, it's all still going to change. And I think I still really like doing rehearsals and letting the, the actors and director do that and see if anything new comes up. And when they're okay with me coming in and watching, then we can see how that might change and change that. Um, but if you have all of that kind of strict planning beforehand, it allows you to do that. And so I think that's, uh, that's really one of the key things is just being so prepared so that when it all changes, you can still keep moving because it doesn't matter if you get, you know, two great looking shots that look the way you want them to look for a film, if you needed eight more to finish telling the story. So you just always have to be aware of kind of what you need. Sometimes a scene only needs that many shots. And so you can take the time for that, or you know you got to finish them up so you can still get to the next thing. Um, so it really does depend on the project. Okay. So this is very, very, very interesting. Okay. So yes. Yeah. Uh, I think this is very, very important. Uh, for us, as a, as a filmmaker, we have to understand all these details and how to work with uh, how to work with uh, our crew, right? How to work with uh, our friends, uh, cinematographers. If we are cinematographer ourselves then how we deal with this uh, situation, how we uh, are able to, uh, to move forward uh, in terms of, you know, we need to, we need a time, right? Uh, and the, the time on set, when the wire on set, the time flies, goes fast. Uh, and then we have to make sure uh, we cover, we have enough coverage. It's a very important aspect of filmmaking is to, to film it probably even every time a little more than less. Uh, you may don't need that uh, tech, it's fine. But let's see, let's say we don't have that tech and uh, we miss something, there's no way we can go back to that location because it was in another country because it's another time of the year, you know, the weather, the lighting, it's not going to match with, with the rest of the stuff we have. So it's always good to film a little more, but also think about timing. You know, we have one day to film this. So make sure we have enough material but that's decision you have to, you know, be very prepared what you call a uh, cinematographer. So um, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's watch another video. Uh, okay, let's watch. I this. read a tweet yesterday in which the woman was like, Todd Phillips, Jimmy Kimmel, and Lawrence Shirk for disrespecting Joaquin Phoenix on that outtake. 
And I'm literally like, it's fake. Have you not read about it? It is fake. My mom thought it was real. She's very embarrassed for me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Larry Sherman, I'm a cinematographer. Today, I'll be talking about color and film and how cinematographers use color to help tell an effective story. For example, how do certain colors contrast on screen to create depth, separation? Uh, remember, we discussed about visuals before, right? Visual, not just the visual effects, but we're talking about visual lighting, how you light the scene is bright, it has color, it has gel on it, it has filters, all those things. So let's watch this video here. Uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes left. Let's watch this video right here. So this one right here. And, and move. You probably noticed the changes just then, right? So let's take it back a second. So this flat, desaturated image. Come on. F Lawrence Sheriff for District. I read about it. It is fake. Today, I'll be talking about color and film and how cinematographers use color to help tell an effective story. For example, how do certain colors contrast on screen to create depth, separation, and loop? You probably noticed the changes just then, right? So let's take it back a second. So this flat, desaturated image is a result of us shooting on a digital camera in something called log. This camera shoots at S log three. You can basically think of it as a raw digital negative before the color grading is happened. The shooting in log lets us retain a wide range of colors recorded by the sensor, which an editor or colorist in post-production can grade any way they want. Much different, huh? We added blue variants, dimmed up the orange to complement the blue. I know it's all technical, trust me. You don't have to think of this technical stuff. I was an economics major. Color and film is comprised of three main elements, the color or hue itself, the saturation or intensity of that, and the brightness, sometimes referred to as value or tone. Saturation is probably the most subjective part of modern filmmaking. Values of color refer to shades or brightness levels. One way to create depth in an image is to use complementary colors or colors opposite each other on the color wheel. Blues go with oranges, reds with greens, yellows with purples, and so on. You can play around to create different color schemes. So how does the cinematographer choose what colors to use in a movie? It's hard to talk about color in motion picture photography without thinking of the legendary cinematographer, Vittorio Storaro. Seriously, after this is over, go watch The Conformist, Last Emperor, Apocalypse Now. He uses color as imaginatively as anybody in film history. He actually had a whole color theory and would assign colors to different moods in the movie, the emotions, the characters. We all have associations with color, memories, how we think about color. It's subjective. For example, green is a color in nature. It may evoke tension or envy or greed, or it may represent power or transition for a character. Whereas warm, yellows and oranges, they evoke emotion like comfort and home, love, tranquility. Yeah, sorry. So color has meaning in film, but it's an aesthetic choice. And some masterful filmmakers choose not to use color in the same way as perhaps Storaro or even myself. And they use a limited color palette or desaturation to tell their stories. I've always appreciated how colors contrast within the same image and how they can be used in movies to help evoke certain emotions and tell the story. Let's look at some examples. In Garden State, the movie opens with him literally in a colorless world. He lives in a tiny apartment with all white walls and white furniture. We're trying to limit the color space because his life is a bit colorless at this stage in the movie. He opens up his mirror, very little color, only the pills are the only color that breaks up the scene. 
He drives to work in a fairly desaturated, busy highway. So then the next contrasting color when he goes here is, is an example of contrasting colors against themselves in scene to scene, not just within a scene. If you are willing to embrace color as a director, like Zach is, you're going to look for opportunities to show color from scene to scene or certainly within the scenes. Fun fact, when we shot this, I said, has anyone actually done this? This is so unrealistic. Like driven away with the host on the car? Three weeks later, I did it. That's what I'm saying. It's clearly marked. Okay? We are definitely not supposed to be up here. So this is a scene from The Hangover, which was the first film I did with Todd Phillips, who directed Joker. And here we are shooting on a practical rooftop in Vegas. And in terms of lighting in here and the contrasting color of light, some of it is not necessarily motivated by emotion, but it's motivated by the desire to want to be authentic to the environment, but also to help separate the world via contrasting color. We had a practical concern, which is we were shooting up there for real. So this is an example of how production design and cinematography are like entwined as closely as they can be, because here as a cinematographer, I was basically helping to design the set by having us put in those fluorescents because we needed to light them in an environment in which we could shoot them from far away, you know, surround them so they have this cyan light. Well, on the rooftops, that red light there, as a way for airplanes and other things to see the rooftops and to see the, the boundaries. So those two contrasting colors of cyan and red made for just a really wonderful way to separate out the actors from their environment. Cheers. 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 What now? We wait. This is a movie I shot called Paul. They arrive on the top of a mountain to basically meet the spaceship that's going to take Paul home. So the moonlight is the dominant source of light here, which is blue with a little bit of cyan, just personal preference as to where I like moonlight to be. They're supposed to see a spaceship coming, and in fact, it's a misdirect because it turns to be the baddie flying in a helicopter to come take Paul away. I've always been really happy with the way this turned out, in part because we decided to put these moving lights on the end of a helicopter. When we talk about color, and if we're talking about here, the color contrast, I love the way that yellow, and that yellow is not a yellow you see really naturally, mixes with the moonlight in this scene. That, that light that came through the trees could have been anything. If we had kept it blue or white light, I just think it doesn't have the same power and the same striking imagery that I was looking for. Another aspect of color in film is color temperature. It has to do with how the color white light looks like on camera in a given temperature. They're measured in Kelvin. You often hear about indoor temperatures, like 3200 Kelvin, and outdoor temperatures, like sunlight, 5500 Kelvin. Lower temperatures are considered warmer and can give an orangish tint to a white object on camera. Higher temperatures are considered cooler and provide a bluish look. So for example, at 3200 Kelvin, if you introduce something at 2,000 degrees Kelvin, it would be very warm and orange, like firelight. And at 5,500 Kelvin, if you introduce something at 10,000 degrees, it would be really blue. Yep. I got to hand it to you, Stu. Place of paradise. So this is from Hangover Part 2. Here's a firelit scene, right? So it's warm, inviting. It's the calm before the storm. So the first image as they wake up is going to be them waking up in a grimy room in the middle of Bangkok. It's daylight, but the lights are all on. There's a tungsten bulb in there to show contrast. There's uncorrected cyan fluorescence. The warm light that's coming in there now is representing heat, right? Because they're sweaty and hot. One of the things that we talked about when we talked about color temperature is the way it shows up in the form of like cool white or warm white. But the other thing that really plays into lighting that we see in our natural world is the green spike, or some lights may be very magenta, but often with fluorescence, they have a very high green spike. So it means in relation to the 3200 film stock, when it shoots an uncorrected fluorescent, as I say, it's also showing up with all that green spike in the form of green. So you mix that cool color temperature with the green and you get cyan. And that's that cyan that we saw in the room when they first woke up. In black and white, you can really see how depth is created with shadows and contrast and tone. The ultimate contrast being the silhouette. 
Obviously, that's one extreme, but there are different values of exposure we can use to varying effects. The famous still photographer Ansel Adams made famous the zone system, which was a way to think about exposure and tonality in a film image. The lowest value, zero, being toad black, and the highest value, 10, being white with very little information at all. So you can think about an image and think of all the tonalities between there in 10 steps of exposure. It's a good way to think about the depth you can create through shadow, light, darkness. But another way to create that depth, in a way I really appreciate, is through color. Two things can be the exact same tonal range, but if they're different colors, they create depth within the same frame. All right, here's a clip from Joker. He's suffering from severe insomnia at this point in the movie. He's going through this real crisis, you know, because Joker in large part is a movie about opposite ends of the spectrum, two sides of yourself, the shadow and the light. And so those contrasting colors is a lot like what's going on internally with Arthur. And that color difference makes a huge impact on the scene. If we drain the color out of this, you can really see what we're talking about when we're saying values and tonality of light. But suddenly, if we bring all the color back in, we're now creating separation with the color. The dramatic difference between the sodium vapor in the background and the uncorrected fluorescent cyan blue. One way to achieve natural color contrast in a movie is to exploit that 15 to 20 minute window each day known as magic hour. When the world is bathed in blue light and the balance of it mixes with all the natural light of the world, street lights, storefronts, fluorescence, anything that's in there is contrasting with that beautiful ambient blue light. This scene from Joker is a perfect example of Todd and I shooting at dusk. We contrasted the build of the storefront that Mark Friedberg, the production designer, did and added a bunch of color contrast in there, different colors to, to play off of the blues. You can get some real beautiful stuff. If you're willing to shoot in this tiny window and if everyone is hyper-focused, funny thing happened though in Joker, on another shoot at dusk, for some reason, right as we began to shoot, right after the second take, they just started handing out tacos to the crew. <laughs> Uh, I went a little crazy because I went, wait a second, we have 20 minutes to shoot this scene. Can we just wait for the tacos? <laughs> One of the fun things about Joker was creating Gotham in the 70s and early 80s. And for me, a large part of that was representing what the cities looked like back then. Well, a big part of the cities back then were the streetlights, and the streetlights were sodium vapor. You don't see sodium vapor as much anymore, and they're really going away. That green, orange, gross light. That's what we saw back then. That's how the city represented itself on film, but also in our memories. A little bit gross, but for me, quite beautiful. It's an example of the blue light that bathes the city at this time of day, and then us adding these warmer sodium vapor lights in those positions of the building. We turn some lights on inside the building. In the interest of the reality of the space and the world in which we live, we're now adding another color, this sort of warm white uncorrected fluorescent, the yellow warm to his lobby. And then when he gets into his home, that's the first time we're introduced to some warm, comforting tungsten light. It's lamps, it's warm, it's inviting, um, and it's probably the warmest, most gentle uh, light that's in the whole movie. The fluorescents that existed back then, they were just gross and ugly and they had a green spike and so in the interest of being authentic to the time, but also loving the contrast of that cyan to the yellow downstairs and then to the red here. This environment, because we're backstage, is a real opportunity to mix a lot of color. But he's gonna go into an environment in which now he has to perform with all these red lights that have shades over them. You can barely see the people. The idea is focusing on Arthur's struggle. So in terms of lighting and the tonality of the scene, the people were meant to be a bit invisible. 
this is really Arthur's moment almost for himself, but this slightly dirty, but a little bit cooler spotlight was in the interest of putting him in a very harsh, almost an interrogation light, overexposed, certainly not something that you can hide from. And here he was exposing himself in a really human way. Let me think a preface that I think is important. Everything I talk about is somewhat emotional and intuitive to me. So I often talk about contrasting colors like yellow and blue because they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. So all you people that know about color theory, yeah, it's complementary. I always say contrasting. Forgive me. I don't know much. I'm just a simple guy trying to make a movie. Thank you so much for watching this. If there's two things you take away, one, all of this technical stuff, don't worry about it. Just feel the scene, feel the emotion of the lighting, and try to express that as best you can in whatever you're doing. And second, I'm behind camera for a reason, so I apologize for all the stumbling around this thing. Use this in whatever way you can and go make something cool. Take risks and remember, no tacos at dusk. Come on, people. Shoot, small window of opportunity here. All right, thank you. Okay, okay, Sarah, what's up? Okay. Uh, that's great. Uh, and uh, the video co and content uh, is excellent. Yeah. Uh, but I, um, uh, because I, um, and my language, my English language is weak, uh, I have less understanding of the content. Okay. Uh, but uh, the course is uh, very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, no worries about that. You know, your English is very good. Mine is not better than yours. So no worries about that. So um, what are you trying to say? Excuse me. What are you here was trying to explain is the value, the importance of color in the film. How we, we work as a cinematographer, how we make things visually to look uh, very good, but also to feel the emotion that we wanted to bring in each character. In this case, he shows different examples of the film he worked in. Uh, how those colors, how the combination of colors was used in a sense to create a meaning uh, in a visual storytelling. Story story so this is very, very important as a cinematographer, even if we don't have any knowledge about cinematography, about cinematography, I'm sorry, about cinematography, but then what's going to happen, you have to understand the color. You wanted to, as a director, you need to know uh, what you wanted to show, how you're going to present the imagery to the audience, how we're going to affect your audience. So the technical things like he, the cinematographer said, don't worry about, cinema, about technical stuff. But understand the emotion, how to present that type of lighting to affect directly in terms of emotion, how this guy get into the refrigerator and how that light show his darkness, his life is going to, is going very dark time for him. It was a very dark time. Then how we show uh, the same artist in front of an artist, how that light or combination of lighting, if you will, how the lighting gonna affect us as an audience to see that same person was going dark before. Right now, he hasn't 
he has to be in a space where he has to sing, he has to present to the audience. He's going to be different than before. How we work with the lighting, the scene, how we would like. How you, we let me reframe the, the question. How we like that scene to make sense and add another layer to the story. That's the question. Every time we do something in terms of filmmaking, every time we do something in terms of storytelling, we have to advance something. If we if we're not advancing, then we stay in the same sp space, we stay in, in the same comfort zone, then the story uh, is not going to have that emotion uh, that Karat needs to make us an audience believe what he's facing in this case uh, is true. So remember, even is a fictional story, but storytelling has to reveal the truth. Even is a documentary or is a fictional story. We have to trust, we have to embrace that character life. So we can understand, we can get into the emotion that we understand and we absorb the story. Ultimately, we sympathize with a character or we don't sympathize with a character. So either way, it must be something that you believe as a filmmaker, but also you want to pass through that information to your audience. If the audience is not going to believe it, then it doesn't make any sense. Then your film is going to fail. It's not going to go anywhere. That's good. Yeah, so I think he, um, we have five minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. Comments? Any? I don't have a question. Um, I uh, research about this uh, again and again. Okay. Okay, so um, if you don't have any question, then I'll share this video with you later as a first uh, section. Uh, then I'll send you those videos. You can Thanks. have it with you. Uh, then um, Go ahead. Uh, if um, no, um, and all um, all of them uh, material of um, um, two se uh, two session um, two session mm -hmm. um, sent uh, to me. Okay, okay, I'll do that. I'll send those videos and uh, <laughs> I'll send the, the recording of the section uh, today's uh, first class. Then we can talk a little more about cinematography, lighting. So today it was important to give you the basics about cinematography. Next time we talk about story, how we work with uh, structure, how we work with uh, character, how we uh, embrace, in a sense, how we deal with the issue, that kind of stuff. Okay? Okay, I'll let you go. You have good rest of your day. Uh, we talk again in about a week or so. Okay. Okay.